going to transport you back to the Middle Ordovician period. Now, what you're looking at is the actually the Cambrian period, the Cambrian fauna. And there's many famous locations where there's exceptionally well-preserved Cambrian fauna, and that's why we have images like this of this world of really wild and crazy looking organisms, right? Looks like a fantasy land, something that uh, you would ask uh, artificial intelligence to make for yourself or something like that. But that's not what drew this. This is actually a, a paleo artist drawing of actual fossils that have been found from the Cambrian. But what we're going to look at today is the Ordovician period. And it's notable because there's a new paper out and I'm just we're just going to take a look at that paper. It just came out two days ago. And it describes a new location where there is a really fantastic preservation of Ordovician organisms or the Ordovician fauna. And the Ordovician follows up on the Cambrian and so represents a time a little bit, well, a little bit later, millions of years later after this particular scene. And it gives us a new snapshot that we haven't had before of what a more advanced Cambrian flora looked like. And so let's take a look at that paper. And this is, this is sort of a new thing for me. I, I would like to look at more like current papers, current research, and give my first reaction to you know what the significance of that research is. And typically my reaction or the significance of that research is going to have to do with my interest in uh, young earth creationism. So I'm gonna reflect upon what I'm seeing in this particular research and what challenges that brings to the world or the group of young earth creationists who are tasked with trying to explain these scenes, but within the context of a very young earth, earth right? Only 6,000 years old. All right, so let's get after it. Let's take a look at a middle order Vician, uh, well-preserved fauna. We've got that coming up. Okay, here we are. This is a paper published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. I don't intend for these looks at uh, recent literature to be long and extensive. We're not going to go through every detail. I'm not going to read you every word of this article. I'm simply going to scan through. We're going to take a look at the most interesting figures and talk a little bit about the significance of this research. So the paper we're looking at today is a Middle Ordovician Burgess Shale type fauna from Castle Bank, Wales, and the UK. So the term Burgess Shale type fauna. So the Burgess Shale is a, is a famous uh, location in Canada that uh, has exceptional preservation of soft-bodied organisms from the Cambrian period. And it's a fauna from the Cambrian period, so animal types from the Cambrian period. And so the indication here is this is a Middle Ordovician, different time period in the geological column, but it has a Burgess Shale type fauna Right? or you could say like fauna, meaning it's not exactly the same organisms that's in the Burgess Shale, not exactly the same organisms that are found actually in multiple locations across multiple continents of Cambrian fauna. But these are Cambrian-like or Burgess Shale-like fauna from the Middle Ordovician period about 50 to 70 million years later after most of the other more famous faunas that you may have seen depictions of. And this is found in Castlebank, Wales. All right, so in Great Britain. Uh, we're going to forego the uh, the abstract here. We're just going to go right down here, just a couple figures. So the location in Wales. Here's a uh, depiction on the right side of uh, the the specific geological uh, portion of the formation. So we're in the Middle Ordovician, and then the Middle Ordovician is divided into uh, subgroups, right, all the way down to uh, specific formations. And Castle Bank is, is one of these. And it's actually between two large uh, volcanic groups, all right, so volcanic uh, depositions. But these are marine deposits, and we're going to see this is a uh, mudstone. So this would be a material deposited in a shallow sea. Uh, and one of the reasons we know it's a shallow sea is because the type of organisms that are present here uh, that would have lived in a not a deep sea um, location, but rather a shallow sea uh, situation where there would have been abundant plankton available. And plankton are photosynthetic organisms, and most of these are filter feeders, so they need a large amount of 
organic material in order to survive, right? They're heterotrophs. At least we think that most of the things that I'm going to show you are heterotrophs, uh, meaning they have to acquire their energy through eating carbohydrates. And those carbohydrates are produced by other organisms. And there aren't any plants in this uh, Ordovician period. Plants as you and I would know them. There's not like large seaweed, or um, which is actually not technically a, a plant in terms of a, what's called a streptobiont, which is a um, a green plant like green algae and then land plants but lots of single-celled photosynthetic organisms exist at this time and are known from the fossil record from the Cambrian and from the Ordovician and so presumably that's what these organisms I'm going to show you in a few moments are eating and they would need a large amount of light all right so all that is to say shallow marine environment uh, is what we're uh, seeing preserved in these rocks in uh, what's called the Castle Rock Formation. And so, and this picture right down here is the actual location of these uh, thin layers uh, of the mudstone that are, that are fracturing. And then by pulling up, apart these fractured pieces, there is preserved in there um, uh, the soft tissued bodies of these organisms. Right? And the neat thing about the, the interesting thing about the Cambrian fauna and then even into the Ordovician fauna is there's very, very few known sort of hard-bodied organisms. Most of the organisms are thought to be soft bodies, like, like types of worms and things like that. And so this is one of the reasons we don't have a lot of examples of Ordovician and Cambrian fauna. There's a lot of Ordovician and Cambrian rock in the world. Uh, and there is evidence that there is preservation of organic type molecules that probably represent the decayed remains of organic or, uh, organic well living things at one time in the past but to actually see enough detail of those that enough detail is preserved for us to actually recreate the organism it's very difficult and it requires very special conditions of preservation as you imagine soft-bodied organisms living in a shallow sea and uh, dying are going to be scavenged very quickly and going to decay very quickly. And so there's very few opportunities to preserve those organisms for us in the fossil record. All right, so there are a few locations on Earth, though, where we have uh, exceptional preservation. And let, let me see, let's show you what exceptional preservation looks like. And you're probably not going to be impressed. <laughs> okay, you're going to be looking at this and you're just like, that's exceptional preservation? All right, it just looks like little pieces of mess um, and these are compressions all right basically the organism sort of squished here and all that's left is uh, the carbon you know material representing where that organism was we're not talking about preservation of soft tissues in the sense that oh we've got three-dimensional structures preserved organs um, we just have basically the shapes of the bodies preserved for us i know it's not a whole lot to look at but the scale bar here is only one millimeter these are very very tiny organisms right now there was some relatively large organisms in the cambrian and in the ordovician but most of the organisms that are multicellular at this stage are still very small multicellular organisms and they're especially small in the ordovician which is actually another interesting thing about this site is most of the organisms here are very similar to types of general body types that are found in the Cambrian, but the overall size of these organisms is quite a bit smaller. I mean, I don't think that's just like all juveniles think that these are actually adult organisms because they have large numbers of them. The amazing thing about this site is that the, the, the persons that, uh, person that found it and then uh, has been working on this site for the last couple of years has looked through thousands and thousands of samples and so they have large numbers of individuals of each different type of organism that they've observed giving them plenty of chances to sort of see a snapshot of the entire community of living things at this particular location at this particular time when they were preserved uh, let's scroll down here because i know that's not an impressive picture some rather fine detail again this is only one millimeter wide so you know, we're only talking about you know little tiny multicellular things that are several millimeters in size sometimes up to a couple centimeters for some of the organisms um, and, but and so the detail that's there is pretty remarkable considering how 
small these are. All right, again, you're not going to be impressed by these, but paleontologists know that this is amazing detail for this particular time period and for the type of organisms that are being preserved. It's very difficult, again, to preserve these, material, these types of organisms, especially over this time period. So let's go down here to the paleo artist recreations of what these organisms represent. And they've looked at, again, I said, thousands of samples and so there's enough detail in these that they can count up body parts uh, they see the mouth parts and as I'm going to show you you can even see a little bit of the of the large nerves that are preserved in a couple of organisms and so we have this is the the this is the diversity of organisms found at this particular location we've got uh, here's uh, this worm that's a polychaete type worm if I'm not correct if I remember right I mean, I'm, not, I'm just going to say it right up front. I'm not an expert on these uh, fauna. I just have broad knowledge of these types of things, but not going to go into like tremendous detail, and I'm not going to do a huge amount of research in order to do these like quick surveys of recent literature. Um, I, you know, I got I don't have enough time to do that much research. Uh, so, like, I don't remember the names of, especially the, some crazy names for these different organisms. But like this, this thing right here in the center has been is very similar to a, a a type of organism found in the Cambrian as well. And then there's a bunch of different kinds of sponges. All right, so sessile organisms that are attached to the to the seafloor and are doing filter feeding. And most everything in here is a filter feeder, except for a few scavengers. Uh, and then you got, these are some trilobites, right? Trilobites are very common and they do find trilobites at this particular location as well. Uh, they're actually a bleach scavenging on, on something like green algae and, and algae on the floor of the sea. We got some starfish, I do at least know that, right? So here's, rep these represent all the different types of organisms that are found in this particular flora. So what's, what's notable about this now is that uh, these represent the types of organisms, the major groups of organisms, brachiopods, sponges, trilobites, all right, major body plans that are found in the Cambrian, but they're taking on somewhat different forms here in this particular location in the middle Ordovician. Um, concluding remarks, and then we've got a couple other figures on here. In summary, Castle Bank fauna preserves an open marine community that is directly comparable with the Cambrian faunas. The extreme fidelity of preservation reveals fine-scaled soft tissues details such as filter feeding arrays, arthropod appendages including grills, gut preservation, eyes, and neural tissue. Now, I know you didn't see that in just like, I'm scanning through and I'm just showing some of the, the figures from the paper. And you probably, and even I, don't pick up on like, oh, there's an eye there, there's neural tissue, there's gut. You know, I can see where the, the, the dark strands inside this, uh, this, this, um, this larger organism is, is the gut material. And so at least I get an idea like the gut runs all the way from the one end to the other, right? The posterior to the, the anterior to the posterior. Um, and that gives us some information about the, the overall general plan of, of how the organism functions. The fauna demonstrates that despite expectations, the taphonomic window remained open, at least locally, into the middle Ordovician. Um, this taphonomic window, meaning these types of organisms had a an environment to live in all the way into the Ordovician and maintained many of the different same types of organisms doing the same types of things over a long period of time. All right, I think this is uh, 426 million years it's dated to, whereas those Cambrian fauna, I can't, can't remember the exact age of the, of the uh, um, Burgess Shale, I really should know that number, but let's say it's I don't remember, 516, 525, 530, a bunch of those numbers ring bells, but they might be different faunas that I'm remembering. Probably should go look it up right now, but let's not do that. Uh, but point is, in the 500s, all right? So that's more than 50 million years after or before this. Uh, the faunal composition and miniaturization of much of the fauna however, unknown from other deposits, highlighting ecological changes during the Ordovician and show a resemblance to modern communities. Castle Bank therefore provides revolutionary new perspective on the development of the Ordovician life and transition from the Cambrian to the later faunas. And that's what 
is so important about this particular new discovery is that it fills a very large gap in the Ordovician, which covers 75 million years. Um, there are only a few locations where we have a, a degree of detail of the types of organisms that were alive at that time. Right? Individual little uh, samples here and there, uh, but no like uh, in the middle of vision, no like no complete faunas of one particular location. Now, of course, this location doesn't necessarily represent all the fauna of the whole world, but as we've seen in the Cambrian and several other different faunas from other ages, uh, shallow marine environments, um, there would be differences maybe between colder and warmer climates, but nonetheless, you're still going to have probably these same types of organisms in shallow marine environments all around the world. And so they really do represent kind of a snapshot of the major types of diversity present at that particular time. Um, okay, so let's go down because what I want to get to is I noticed this figure. And so in this figure here, we've got a more detailed cross section of this er particular area and the Ordovician. And so I want to point a couple features here, which uh, are, you know, when I think about a uh, young earth creationist, when that's in the back of my mind, and I think like, well, how would they explain this particular data? I've already given hints to a perspective of how to interpret this data uh, in the context of an ancient earth. But how would a young earth creationist explain this particular fauna? And the simple answer might be, oh, I could see Ken Ham or another young earth creationist just looking at this and going like, well, yeah, more proof for a young earth. Like, how would you preserve all those soft bodied organisms if it weren't for something that happened really, really fast? Like they had to be buried really quickly, right, immediately in order to, you know, seal them right into the fossil record. And that allows us to see these, you know, 4000 years later. It's because of this quick preservation. And what could cause that quick preservation? Oh, well, obviously Noah's flood, right? That must be what is responsible. So that's a very granular, generic explanation. And to the, I'll say the uninformed and geologically naive, that sounds like, oh yeah, right? I mean, if this was just an open ocean and organisms are, are dying and all these rocks, right, are very gradually accumulating adding on top of each other, then those organisms would be dying and decaying and we wouldn't actually get good preservation. But like the Birch's Shale, like several other locations where we have exceptional preservation, pretty sure in all those different sites, this is not a situation where we have gradual deposition, right? Paleontologists, geologists would say that these particular locations where they have the best preservation, there was very fast preservation in the sense of uh, immediate uh, deposition of material on top of these organisms, typically undersea landslides. All right, so you have some mud uh, sliding down from, from a little bit higher elevation uh, in the shallow sea on a continental shelf, and then bearing basically like an avalanche, right, an undersea avalanche. That undersea avalanche then covers over this flora, which is living on the, on the surface and immediately preserves it from you know oxygen um, breaking down these different organisms and because it's completely covered and smashed even as they are decaying they're leaving the remains of you know some organic materials the carbon right and this is this sort of the, the carbon scars we see left that you were then able to say well there's the shape of this particular organism um Oh, wait, so I'm going to go back to this. Over here, we've got, uh, I'm going to show you the diversity, right, the complexity of the geological column. So just at this particular location, um, we look at, there's a variety of different layers, and the numbers over here on the side are two, three, four, five, six. Those are meters. Remember that? Yeah, those are meters. So meters thick. So eight, eight meters, you know, 24, 25 feet of material here. And in that, we've got, say, laminated black siltstone, right? That might represent layers of just gradual deposition, you know? Deposition of organic and uh, inorganic material falling out in the shallow sea and just building up in muck, all right, 
on, on the bottom. But then you'll see there there's these lines here where there's other material that's of a different different composition. And in particular, um, we've got uh, these silt stones in here. And within the silt stone, there is bentonite. All right, now what bentonite is? Bentonite is what, ha what you get when you have volcanic ash, right? Volcanic ash that's airborne, right? So you have, an, you have a volcano somewhere, presumably on land near this continental shelf, spews ash into the air, falls on the ocean, and it interacts with the salt water, right? It's specific to salt water, right? This doesn't happen in fresh water. So in, in reaction to the salt water, there's a chemical reaction that occurs that, cre that, that creates what's called this bentonite. Uh, and that bentonite then, uh, as, it's, as it's falling through the water column, accumulates on the bottom and forms, in this case, if, the, if it's a shallow sea and there's not a lot of disturbance, then you might get a, just a layer of this bentonite. And then what, what happens after that? Well, you get sediments falling on top of that. There's two layers of bentonite. So that would represent two separate volcanic explosions at two different times with deposition of silty materials in between. Okay, so right away we see that bentonite forms from volcanic explosions, interaction with salt water. These are two separate historical events separated by some time. You have to keep in your mind that how do young earth creationists explain this particular ge portion of the geological column? They would say this portion of the geological column is very early in Noah's flood because these organisms in their particular model are the very first organisms that are preserved and they consider them to be like deep sea fauna because this would be like the first place where sediments get laid down. And so, and how fast would this be happening? All of this geological column, all these 25 feet of material here would all have to be laid down. All these layers have to be laid down within, you know, minutes, days, uh, at most a few days because there's going to be a lot of material laid down on top of that by later stages of the flood. All right, so if it's happening in minutes, how do you get separate layers of bentonite? See, this is what occurs in the fossil record in the geological column all over the place are very discrete depositions you know, uh, of material. And it's one thing to try to explain deposition of different kinds of sandstone, siltstone, and mudstone, which are hard enough. But then you have intermixed in those, not actually intermixed, in between some of those layers, you have this bentonite or other kinds of volcanic ash if it was in uh, a, a non-marine environment. And that ash, in order to fall in a discrete unit, would have to, um, it, there has to be a volcanic explosion. There also has to be ash in the environment, but it can't mix with a lot of other things as it gets deposited, or we wouldn't have the, the layer we have there that's almost pure volcanic ash that's just that should defy you know i'm doing another series called uh, flood geology failures <laughs> bentonite is a flood geology failure you know they, they can't uh, they don't have an adequate ex explanation for places where we see these very fine layers of volcanic ash or the geological column all right but now we're still getting to all right how did we get these really well preserved fossils and this is where I want to emphasize that in this just in this particular section they have highlighted here in this brown section, which they then expanded, all right? And they've divided it into a whole bunch of subsections that they have then uh, taken a look at, right? They've examined multiple different layers. And some of these layers, they're not, they don't show it over here, but some of these layers have themselves have different textures in them. And... Uh, representing different depositional time periods, right? And these could be over tens of years, hundreds of years, or thousands of years of deposition on the bottom of the shallow sea. And within those, this little area of red corresponds to A3 and A4, and there you have these red stars. And what the red stars represent is Burgess Shale-type preservation. And what they're saying is Burgess Shale is like well-known for its good preservation, exceptional preservation. And like all the organisms are really well preserved, but just in that one little tiny section, which here's your bar that's one meter, right? So over one meter, only a small portion of that 
So we're looking at, you know, if this is a little over three feet, this is less than a foot, all right? It's just in the rock in that particular section that we had the best preservation, the Burgess Shale type preservation. Outside of that, this dark blue uh, represents, we don't have very many fossils at all, right? And the red means we have some uh, fossilization and we have some exceptional fossils, but some that aren't so great, right? And so really all the best pictures and the, and the diagram of the organisms that are living in that location are really just in this one little thin section. And then they've expanded that section so you can see, hey, you've got this bentonite layer. Above the bentonite layer, basically, they don't have fossils. Now, that's interesting, right? Because if there was a volcanic explosion and it sent ash into this shallow sea, and this could be an inland sea or something like that, right? Not necessarily like open to the vast open ocean, but it's an open area of water. But if you had a large amount of volcanic ash, and that doesn't look very large, but if you have a few inches, that represents a lot of ash because it's going to be compacted a lot. Uh, and so we're talking about original amount of ash being, you know, could have been six or seven inches. That's a significant volcanic event. And if that covered a whole area, you can imagine that's probably killing off the organisms in that area, all right? It's essentially sterilizing the water. And then after that, what you have is deposition by just by normal um, sedimentation. And there aren't really any organisms to, well, for one thing, organisms aren't going to be preserved well in just normal uh, sedimentation. All right. And there may not have been many organisms. They might have all been dead. Right? So that bentonite layer is, is very interesting because that's a break point there, right? It's almost like a little mini extinction event. And then right before that, we have a large number of the best preserved things. And what we have is a lot of interbedding in there. And that seems to represent a, a large amount of deposition over a fairly short period of time and a little bit chaotic. All right, so we have interlaying of different types of, of sediments before. So that looks like that is a landslide deposit, right? A bunch of material that's kind of sliding down maybe there you know if there was a big large volcanic explosion maybe there was lots of earthquakes right before it right earthquakes caused now i'm just speculating here but this is not you know, this is a reasonable inference from the observations from the from the from the things that we see in the geological column earthquakes cause landslide landslide then preserves all these samples and then you have volcanic ash that lands on top of that right which probably is like an, an added uh, preservative <laughs> for this particular location and it could be that in the times before maybe the thousands of years before there's been other smaller events that have preserved some samples really well in some very thin layers whereas most of the layers don't have very very good fossils in them at all all right so interesting that the fossil record contains little bursts of exceptional preservation. So what does a global flood model predict, really? Right? I don't think it can predict the complexity of the geological column right here. I don't think it can predict, it definitely doesn't predict you're going to have thin bentonite layers being just, you know, laid down uh, without disturb being disturbed in a chaotic global flood. Right? So that's a failure of flood geology. But it would also predict that if all these layers were laid down very, very quickly, then any organisms that are, that are found present, jumbled up in any of those layers should all be preserved really well. They should all experience exceptional preservation, right? You got thousands of feet of sediment being placed down in just a period of days or weeks. Everything that's contained in that should be exceptionally preserved. But the actual observation from the fossil record is that we have little tiny windows of exceptional preservation, and most of it is not very well preserved, right? Flood geology, I don't think, can explain that. I don't think any, the diversity of different preservation states. But in a creation seminar, Ken Ham just talking about this very, very generically, it's like, oh, global flood, like large amounts of preservation. That's how billions of things are preserved. 
Um, and it sounds so simple until you actually look at like here is like somebody has drawn out for us here what they're seeing on the side of that uh, that hillside there as they're collecting samples and they're collecting throughout up and down and then making observations and finding out that oh you know we stumbled upon this one little section where it's awesome right we learned all this stuff about the middle ordovician fauna but we learned it all from just one little location because there was probably one special set of events that occurred at that point in history that preserved them but it didn't preserve organisms at other times in other parts of the column all right that's the main point let me just scroll down here and show you they have lots of other pictures um, and here they're trying to reconstruct some of the things that they're seeing um, you know, so this is how they're getting like, hey, they, these have the thorax and abdomen, right? These are the major body parts. Um, here are some of the sponges. And again, these are only several centimeters in size. So it's kind of weird to think about, but you know, it's like, okay, here's the floor. And then you just have these little tiny, tiny creatures, <laughs> tiny, tiny animals yeah, around there with like some stalks sticking up. Uh, and some of the some of the sponges are you know five or six inches uh, tall. So it's not like you know it's like, huge sponges that are like ten feet tall or anything like that. So this is a very foreign world still. Oh, let's let's look at this figure too. Um, so here they have listed in the middle all the different major types of organisms, right? Echinoderms, bryozoans, annelids. Those are worms. Brachiopods. Those would be shelled organisms along with mollusks. Right, so these represent major groups of organisms that, that exist today. Uh, porphyra, that's uh, the sponges. And then over here, they have so many samples, right, that they can say, like, here's how many different species uh, we identify from the, I think this is the abundance, yes, of the Castle Bank fauna, right, current estimated diversity. So we're talking about a lot of different organisms. I mean, that picture didn't that I showed you of the paleo artist recreation, they're just showing the major groups that are found there. They're not showing all the diversity of organisms um, that are found there. And then over here, they have abundance curve. That just means like how abundant are they? Because they've collected thousands and thousands and thousands of samples, they can get a good idea of like there's a lot of these type of organism and there's only a few of these and some were exceptionally rare, right? There's just a few of those, right? There's a lot of trilobites, right? And there was a, a lot of sponges, right? And a lot of graptoloids, um, but there's not many, uh, barely any chordates. And these aren't chordates like you're thinking, you know, like, uh, you know, bony fish or something like that. These are uh, things that have uh, the very, very first type of backbone, the notochord, in extremely primitive, what will become fish. Right. And so I think what's also important to point out is there's lots of things missing here. So there's a lot of things that if you go to the beach or you were to snorkel and look in the shallow in a shallow sea, there's a lot of different kinds of organisms there today that don't exist and aren't captured in this. And yet we have what seems to be a very full snapshot of what existed at that moment in that shallow sea, uh, because how would really anything escape that uh, occurrence? Uh, everything that was there essentially is captured at that moment in time. And so I think we can be fairly confident that because of the total number of samples they have from that site, that we have a good picture of the types of organisms that are present. Oh, yes. All right. So this uh, figure P and Q. All right. Unidentified arthropod with bilobed uh, tail fan uh, and head region preserving eyes and presumed neural tissue. Right, so right here, these are the eyes. There would have been an eye over here. And then between the two, there's a, a neural cord connecting the two. And we see this in, in, in very primitive uh, animals that have very simple uh, nervous tissue. Uh, and so this is essentially, I mean, not really a brain because they don't really have brains, but um, this tracks where the large bundles of nerves were. And we're not saying that the nerves themselves are there right we're saying that the presence of those nerves is preserved right so they've been replaced by different uh, minerals 
Right. And then I think this is uh, mostly uh, pyrite, uh, pyritiz pyritization that's occurring here. Uh, and so it's a particular chemical reaction that results in uh, the encrustation of different parts all right, uh, at different times. And so the nerves being uh, highly compact and having uh, sheaths on them might have lasted a little bit longer and so got preserved in a, in a little bit different way. And so we can actually see that contrast between where the nerves were and the rest of the tissue. Um, so that's what I mean by, you know, exceptional preservation. Again, I know, apologize. I, you know, you're thinking you're going to see something that's like, oh, look at this. I, I can tell what everything is. But people who study this stuff and look at it a lot can get a lot out of these types of fossils, especially after looking at thousands of them and you're only seeing representations of them here. Okay, I think that's it for... Uh, for this paper, a middle order vision uh, sample. Yeah, I'll say that, um, uh, you know, what we have is you have these types of faunas from the Cambrian and Ordovician uh, found again on different continents of the world. And since they date sort of to a similar age, that's where geologists, paleontologists develop the idea that the world only consisted at that particular time of these types of organisms. And by looking at different fauna, as we discover more and more of these, we're able to see that no single fauna is identical to other ones at different time periods. All right, we have a couple faunas that are very close in time age and the types of organisms that are there are virtually the same types of species, which is what you would expect. And then when you look at something that's dated 70 million years later, you would expect to see differences in those organisms, right? Different compositions of fauna because they have adapted to each other differently or maybe there's a new type of organism that's present that has caused all the other ones to adapt to that. And so we see that this Ordovician fauna is not the same as the Cambrian fauna. Um, it has transitioned to having a different composition and it has additional features on the organisms that the Cambrian fauna lack altogether. And so if you want to talk about transition fossils, or really it's better to say like a transition communities, right? This community is a, a, a full of transition fossils from only in their, well, transition in the respect of an intermediate between the Cambrian fauna and then later faunas that come after the Ordovician. So when you start to get to the Devonian, right, the Devonian, you start seeing those, those uh, uh, well, Devonian is quite a bit later, but eventually you're going to see uh, more advanced types of fish, right? You start to get vertebrates, you know, in the fossil record. There aren't any vertebrates here, right, in the sense that you're thinking vertebrate. There's uh, things with a notochord, um, just the very first inklings of some type of backbone, but it's not hardened in the same sense that you're thinking of like, uh, you know, vertebra and stuff. All right, I've reached the extent of my knowledge of the Ordovician period, so I better stop talking now. But let's just park it right here and say that uh, it's just a... Uh, I, I still marvel at the bizarreness, right, <laughs> of this past world. And young earth creationists, you know, they, they will say that, um, you know, yeah, these may be the way the organisms looked based on the fossils. And these just represent floras that existed before Noah's flood that got completely wiped out and they no longer persist today. Um, but it's rather strange that you can capture an entire flora like this and it's missing all kinds of shells, organisms, and you know, uh, things that we would normally associate with the beach. Uh, but they don't seem to have existed at this particular time. Uh, and so that's another challenge to young earth creationism is to explain the distribution of these types of fauna uh, in the fossil record. Okay, yeah, I really am going to quit now. So thanks a lot. I'm working on this format still. We'll see if this is interesting to anybody. I might continue to look at uh, current papers. If not, then you know, I'll stop doing it because I've got lots of other things I can talk about. Got that. Uh... <laughs> thanks a lot.
We'll talk to you later. <laughs> Bye-bye.